We present at this time the regular Sunday afternoon address of Father Charles E. Coughlin from Royal Oak, Michigan. Ladies and gentlemen, this afternoon, Father Coughlin will address you on the subject of 10 million unemployed. For the information of our new friends on this radio presentation, may I inform you that this hour is paid for at full commercial rates. In no wise is it donated. It is your hour. Father Coughlin is your spokesman and seeks welcome in your home as a guest each Sunday at this same hour and over these same stations. Before he delivers his address, he has an important announcement to make to you. Father Coughlin. Good afternoon, my friends. Permit me in your name and in my own to thank the hundreds of thousands of persons in this audience who communicated with their congressmen, urging them to keep America free from foreign entanglements, and specifically to refrain from lifting the embargo on Spain. According to authentic reports, at least 150,000 telegrams, besides uncounted thousands of letters and petitions, descended upon Washington last week as a result of your zeal last Sunday. Until recently, propaganda for lifting the embargo in favor of communist Spain was in the ascendancy. When letters and petitions from Christians and Americans began to deluge the congressmen saying, do not lift the embargo, the tide began to change in our favor. Then followed the flood of your telegram. Results rapidly developed. The Senate Foreign Relations Committee refused to take any action at this time on the neutrality bill, which means and contains the lifting of this embargo. Then the governments of Great Britain and France issued formal statements to the effect that they also would refrain sending arms, munitions, and men to assist loyalist Spain. Loyalist Spain, which is identified with communist Spain. Thus, neutrality was preserved, and the first step in a series of events which would have led us into war was avoided. Therefore, again, I congratulate the patriotic Americans for their timely interest in our national affairs. Our congressmen now recognize how unalterably opposed are their constituents, not only to aiding and abetting communism, but to any policy which leads to an offensive war against any nation. For the past several months, I have been deceived by some over-enthusiastic but impractical persons who have pleaded with me to organize this audience into a concrete unit for the purpose of opposing communism and advancing the principles of Americanism and social justice. Steadfastly, I have refrained from doing this. Experience has taught me that any concrete physical regimentation of this audience is a detriment to our cause. First and foremost, the majority of Americans sicken at the thoughts of regimentation. They are content to be Americans and Christians. They do not relish being herded into meetings, subjected to harangue, and directed too often by inefficient officers of a political temperament who succeed in gaining control of these meetings. Moreover, the experience gained on the occasion of the reorganization bill, the World Court, and the Do Not Lift the Embargo campaign, this experience Experience indicates that our strength lies in our seeming weakness. And by weakness, I mean the fact that we are not a regimented, corporate, organized group. We are Americans and Christians who, when the occasion demands, will rise in unison to us. Please do not misinterpret me. I am not setting myself up as the leader of this unorganized organization. It is my intention simply to present to you, not in the name of the church, 
not in the name of any political party, but in my own name and on my own responsibility. The principles which I conceive are fundamental for the preservation of Americanism and Christianity. Briefly, I hope to encourage you to support these principles in the face of opposition not only originating from communists, but also from the non-Christian minorities who refuse to cooperate with us officials. It is needless to remark that Christian American is shocked by the practice silence of this minority. We Christians, however, must not entertain the crude ideas commonly associated with anti-Semitism. We Americans must steadfastly abhor all appeals to national prejudice. But in holding fast to these principles, we serve notice that anti-Christians and plotting internationalists, be they Greek, Irish, German, Polish, or Jew, are mistaken if they think they can preserve their safety by hiding behind the veil of their nationality while they promote either directly or indirectly their propaganda. Respectable Greeks, Irish, Germans, Poles, and Jews should not hesitate to be the first to condemn the betrayers of their own race who are either active supporters of or sympathizers with communism or any otherism opposed to religion and to Americanism. Therefore, each Sunday afternoon, it shall be my endeavor as an individual to give expression to the common truth which you and I both love, the truth by which we live and for which we are prepared to suffer. These I shall explain conservatively and as clearly as I am capable of doing. I shall advise you of their application and inform you of the activities of those who are opposed to Americanism and to Christianity and to peace. No organization is required for this. The bonds of our common religious and national heritage are sufficiently strong to bind us together for the success of this program. How long shall I continue in this role as spokesman for an unorganized organization? Just as long as you bid me welcome in your home. That time will be measured by my fidelity to the principles which I am willing to uphold without compromise or favor against the organized efforts of those who would substitute their racial supremacy for our nationalism and their atheistic internationalism for our Christianity. Necessarily, my visit to your home each Sunday afternoon will be limited by the hour hand on the clock. And necessarily, this brief period restricts me to the discussion of a particular subject pertaining to the radicals and their supporters in government, in journalism, in radio, and even in religion. But there are many other subjects which time does not permit me to discuss. Well, then, can you learn the full story and keep abreast of the news? Naturally, the daily journals are in no position to record the activities of radicals because only too often they are the sources of news controlled by the disciples of Antichrist. For that reason, I have endeavored to supplement my radio visits to your home by publishing Social Justice Weekly magazine, which already enjoys hundreds of thousands of readers. More than two years have elapsed since this publication was born. It was called into existence particularly with these present days in mind. Days which find us prostrate in the mire of a man-made depression. Days which find our minds besieged with the propaganda of half-truths and misinterpretation. Days in which our enemies, through their power, lead the public to believe that the diabolical dictatorship of 
Darling is a democracy. That the fanaticism of the loyalists in Spain is on the side of Christ. Days when a perfectly planned attempt is being made to destroy America and hand it over constitution and all to the foes of our liberty as we are engaged in the Holocaust of another world war. These things Social Justice Magazine takes pride in discussing. Its pages also attempt to present vital information on labor, finance, agriculture, and international affairs in which sphere the policies of our opponents have created worldwide disorder. It is only with reluctance that I pause to remind you of the difficulties which we experienced in securing broadcasting outlets for these Sunday addresses. Chicago, New York City, and Philadelphia, the three largest cities in the United States, are eloquent examples of the power possessed by our opponents. These three instances indicate that we Christian Americans have little or no voice in controlling the renting policy of many major radio stations. The same difficulties which confront us in renting radio facilities are experienced by the publishers of Social Justice magazines in the matter of circulation. In the majority of cases, the controllers of the newsstands throughout the nation adopt towards us the same attitude which has characterized the policies of the national radio chain. That is why social justice is not sold to the regular distributing agents. Not because it is anti-Semitic, but because it is pro-Christian and pro-American and pro-peace. In view of this conspiracy to muzzle free speech and free press, I feel it is my duty to bring to your attention the knowledge that you can secure a copy of this fearless modern news weekly, either by encouraging some person to organize a news agency in your locality, or preferably by your writing to me directly and instructing me to mail you this publication every Thursday morning. The pages of Social Justice magazine carry no advertising because none has been solicited. I do not care to ask corporations or manufacturers to commit themselves to us by patronizing our news weekly, lest in turn they become innocent targets of attack from our organized opponents who have no qualms of conscience in having recourse to the boycott. It is better that Social Justice magazine retain this policy. For on the other hand, no critic will be able to say that our editorial contents are colored by the advertising dollar or that we fear to point out the iniquities of certain corporations towards their exploited working men. We are independent. As an example of the material appearing in social justice, which under ordinary circumstances is not suitable for discussion over the radio, we will publish next week a form letter sent out by the German-American Committee for Spanish Relief. This letter, written in German, and already mailed to the majority of German-speaking residents in the Middle West, is begging for money for the relief of the Spanish loyalists the Spanish communists, and for postcards to be sent to President Roosevelt to lift the embargo. On its upper left-hand corner appear the names of its sponsors, more than three-quarters of whom, yes, four-fifths of whom, are not Christian, and practically all of whom are identified with subversive movements. Another example taken from next week's issue is an editorial on the Irish bombings in England. Few of you know that Prague, the capital of Czechoslovakia, 
until recently was the headquarters of worldwide subversive activity. And fewer of you possess the information that these headquarters in part have been removed to Dublin, Ireland this past month and a half. The current stories, therefore, appearing in our newspapers, blaming the Irish people for the English bombings, are only half true. Our news weekly points out that this propaganda proposes to liquidate the good esteem which Christians over the world entertain towards Neville Chamberlain, the Prime Minister of England, through the agency of the imported radicals from Czechoslovakia into Ireland, whom they have concentrated at Dublin. They are the ones, and not the Irish, who are responsible for the bombing for which the Irish Republicans are blamed. Once more, I make the point that Social Justice magazine supplements this radio hour by publishing a plenitude of information which time does not permit me to mention over this microphone. This is the independent, non-political, pro-American, anti-communist, and pro-peak Newsweek which does not fear to discuss certain facts which hitherto have been whispered only in the privacy of the living room or in the secrecy of the club. Its ownership is entirely in my control, and the profits, if any, derived from its publication are dedicated towards this broadcast and towards keeping the American citizens from becoming refugees in their own country. For surely we will be refugees if we permit our America to be captured ideologically and racially by a minority group whose agents even one week ago would have injected us into a world war on the side of the sickle and the hammer. Another sample of next week's news concerns the Honorable Joseph Kennedy. Just this last week, a leftist attack was launched against the American ambassador to Great Britain by Messrs. Pearson and Allen, the Washington writers for the Red Record of Philadelphia and the Post of New York. Their column, entitled The Washington Merry-Go-Round, has been well utilized to give the American people a merry-go-round, especially when it reports that Joseph Kennedy favors the loyalist communist forces in Spain. Every informed Christian American knows that this is a calumny, but everyone does not know that out of respect for the dignity of his office, Mr. Kennedy is not able to answer these professional purveyors of misinformation. With our excellent staff of local editors and foreign correspondents, Social justice will inform the American public of such half-truths and full-truths which other news journals care not or dare not publish. It is likewise our policy to unfold the attempt about to be made during the next several months to centralize our government, to jeopardize our liberty, to perpetuate the dole system, to entangle us in foreign affairs and to lead the destinies of our people, our Christian American people, with the destinies of Stalin or with European nations in another world war. Our critics will accuse us of being prejudiced. We are prejudiced. Prejudiced in the proper sense of the word. We're prejudiced on the side of Americanism and Christianity. We're prejudiced against communism, Nazism, and racial domination. We're prejudiced in preserving our constitution. We're prejudiced in upholding the social order preached by Jesus Christ. I bring these thoughts to your mind because the future of Social Justice magazine, and in one sense, the future of these broadcasts, depends upon your response this week to my suggestion that you become a subscriber of this publication. May I take this opportunity to express my heartfelt thanks 
to all those who have subscribed for social justice and thereby kept its publication alive against odds up to this date. And may I inform this intelligent audience that a letter addressed to me this week will bring Social Justice Magazine regularly to your home every Friday and Saturday if you will instruct me to put your name on the mailing list. I am anxious that you will know the truth and know the Christian American interpretation of the events which sometimes are not fully explained in other causes. Pardon my intrusion upon your time with this announcement, but I repeat I am anxious for you to become a regular subscriber to this magazine which has been ostracized from the newsstand simply because it is Christian and American, a magazine that will keep you well informed of the news behind the news, a magazine that is fearless in its determination to keep America a Christian constitutional country and to keep America out of the next world war. Therefore, I ask your indulgence again when I solicit you to write to me this week instructing me to place your name on our mailing list. And now, the 10 million unemployed. Recently, I gave expression to the thought that I fear an army of 10 million unemployed American citizens more than I do the possibility of our country being overrun by 10 million foreigners. What is the basis for such fear? Or more pertinently, why is there so much unemployment? Why are so many factories closed? So many industries working on part-time? These questions are very provocative and deserve the attention of every sincere American. For it is my opinion that if this criminal unemployment, criminal less than living wage, and criminal sabotaging of American industry, if these are permitted to continue without our best effort having been put forth to cure their causes, the millions of unemployed will not be assuaged by our pleadings to hold fast to the Constitution, to democracy, or to Christianity. I am casting no aspersions whatsoever upon those who have been victimized by our economic process. To them I would tender my sympathy if I did not appreciate that the time for sympathy has long since passed, and that the time for Christian American action is at hand. Ladies and gentlemen, radical remedies are no cure for radical abuses. While we quarrel and argue amongst ourselves as to the best means to be chosen to eliminate unemployment, stem the tide of confiscation to taxation. Our opponents are united on a program which aims at overthrowing our constitutional government and of nationalizing our basic industry. They appeal to the working class to support their program. They suggest to the laboring men that poverty and unemployment then will cease. And what are we accomplishing? How long will this vast sector of our outraged citizenry maintain its patience? Is there not danger, imminent danger, that a multitude of citizens who year after year are forced into unnecessary idleness eventually will succumb to this alien brand of radical propaganda which parades under the banner of democracy? Uncertain salient proposition, none of us in this audience differ in our opinion. None of us, though we be divided amongst the laboring, the industrial, the professional, or the agricultural class, all agree that we are suffering from unemployment and also suffering from a tragic need of goods. 
all agree that unemployment does not exist because we have no factories, no raw materials, no sufficiency of inventors, of skilled engineers, of fine executives, and of trained workmen. There is no nation in this wide world which God has blessed with such fecundity, both in materials and in men, as this United States. All agree, despite our political leaders, that there was never such a demand for the finished products which our country's institutions are capable of manufacturing, never such a deficiency in goods as exists at the present moment. Unfortunately, when we recite the litany of our agreement, we find ourselves in disagreement in too many instances when we attempt to place our finger upon the causes of our economic distress, causes which are translated better by the word unemployment. Why then is there unemployment? Why are 10 million American breadwinners forced to live in distress and idleness? Why are 20 million Americans sentenced to eke out their existence in a dole line? I do not regard myself as one who can answer definitely and concisely these perturbing questions. Nevertheless, Permit me to express an opinion which may be helpful in bringing together the influential and serious minds of labor and industry, minds which can contribute substantially to the solution of these enigmas. A solution must be had, and it must be had quickly. The genius of America which conquered slavery, which multiplied cities and towns from the Atlantic to the Pacific, which wove them together with ribbons of steel and wires of copper. This genius cannot be stifled in its effort to find a cure for the economic disease which threatens to destroy us, destroy our constitution, destroy our Christianity. My friends, on these points, there is no dissension. But from here on, some in this audience, perchance, will have occasion to present controversial views, which I trust will stimulate all of us to serious thought. A few years ago, a group of scientists who called themselves technocrats traced unemployment chiefly to the modern development of mass production machinery, which made possible a multiplied production of goods with less human labor. Modern machinery does multiply the production of goods and requires fewer laborers than were needed before hand tools were replaced with power tools. But the argument of the technocrats is not quite so compelling today as it was six or seven years ago. I believe that we must search for the cause of unemployment outside the sphere of mass production machinery. For despite all our modernized factory equipment, we could not produce one half enough goods to supply the demands of all Americans for the next five years of every factory was operating five days a week and eight hours a day. In looking elsewhere, then, for the cause which inflicts unemployment on 10 million fellow Americans, let us reminisce for a few moments. Before the World War, the problem of unemployment began to clamor for attention. It is true that in many instances, before 1914, working men were not paid sufficiently for the amount of goods which they produced. 
But during the World War, remember that unemployment suddenly vanished. Between the years 1914 and 18, millions of our men were occupied in government service or in manufacturing war materials. Because our European allies had conscripted the last available man for military service, their factories in Europe were understaffed, with the result that Europeans could not produce the amount of armaments and munitions required by their own arms, nor could their depleted agricultural population supply the citizenry and the soldiers with sufficient food. America was the builder of war equipment. America was the pantry of the world between 1914 and 18. Those were the years when the United States not only supplied money and men and food to Europe for the continuance of the world war, but also contributed an inestimable amount of other materials which in time of peace would not have been imported by the Europeans. As a result, every available American working man was at work. The amazing prosperity which resulted in our country during these years was made possible by the billions of credit dollars which were poured directly into industry and indirectly into the pockets of the laborers for the conduct of war. Please remember that point. There was prosperity because there was war. And there was war because those who owned and controlled money were willing to issue the sufficiency of credit dollars through which the war was fought. Following the armistice in 1918, Our armament factories were closed. Millions of veterans returned to their homes. They were jobless. The European market for munitions and for food and other materials was practically closed to us. As a result, there appeared in our midst an army of unemployed American citizens. The war was over. The credit expansion for destruction had ceased. And unemployment was with About 1920, two years after the armistice, Europe turned its attention to a program of reconstruction. The devastation wrought by the army called for rehabilitation. Cities had to be rebuilt. Men had to be put to work on a continent from which all the gold, practically speaking, had been drained. I pause to remind you that these were the days when money was predicated upon gold. If you didn't have gold, you couldn't print money. These were the days when money, be it the currency in your pocketbook or the credit of your checkbook, depended upon the amount of gold in your national treasure. These were the days when one half of the commercial gold in all the world found refuge in the vaults of the United States. Today, practically two-thirds of it is here. Well, in 1920, European financiers and diplomats approached our government and bankers for aid. As a result, a plan was devised by which our banks and government loaned billions of credit dollars, not actual dollars, based on gold to European nations with the understanding that they would use our loans to purchase both raw materials and finished goods from the Americans for the furtherance of foreign reconstruction. Once more, our factories would be busy producing materials for Europe. So this plan was soon put into effect. Immediately, we witnessed a new spot in production. The problem of unemployment again was solved, at least temporarily. Well, nothing succeeds like success. When our bankers discovered how beneficial was this credit expansion for the nations abroad, they began to encourage our own local governments to the Federal Reserve Board 
and they advocated a parallel credit expansion for America. Every corporation was encouraged to borrow and to borrow. Municipalities and states accepted loans not only for the necessary conduct of government and improvement, but also for useless enterprises. As some humorists have expressed it, those were the days when we started building concrete sidewalks in the country for the convenience of the cars. Then came 1929. Billions of credit dollars had been loaned by our banks to individuals, corporations, and governments for the form and abroad. And of a sudden, the geniuses of the financial world became alarmed. Because, so they thought, more credit had been extended than it was possible for the borrowers to repay. And recognizing that they had gone too far in having loaned 20 and 30 times more credit than was represented by their gold and their assets, they began to refuse to renew loans already existing and they began to demand payments of these debts from the borrowers. Well, what happened? As a result, the credit bubble burst. Individuals forfeited their factories, their homes, and their farms, which they had placed as security for their loans because they had no actual dollars to pay back the loan. Foreigners simply repudiated the repayment of debt. The market value of stocks depreciated. Factories were closed. Production was paralyzed. And again, unemployment resulted. The purchasing power of the country all but disappeared, while 17 million breadwinners began to seek food, clothing, and shelter from their friends and charitable institutions. I believe that I have not overemphasized certain vital facts which were antecedent to the disaster which befell us in 1929. Oh, those were the days when it was still considered unsound for the federal un government to be interested in caring for the victims of these facts. Those were the days when a great group of important citizens still believed that Shylock's death of a pound of flesh must be paid despite the reasonable objections voiced by any torture. They failed to understand that if they insisted upon the last pound of financial flesh under such trying circumstances, there was another law, an unwritten law, an inevitable natural law emblazoned upon the pages of history which soon would be invoked to their own confusion. It is my observation that any government or group of men whose policies control the government, which insists that financial rights are more sacred than our human rights, the right to live and to be clothed, the right to be sheltered and to enjoy the frugal conveniences of life, that government or group of men is dicing with disaster. Probably some of the thoughts which I have just expressed are not acceptable to many persons in this audience. Nevertheless, they are thoughts which are entertained by so many Americans that they are worthy of consideration in our common effort to evolve a common re remedy for our present unemployed. How many of us understand the weakness of a policy which lends credit dollars at interest to be used in purchasing bayonets, shrapnel, shell holes, and white crosses? Is it not true that after all this money has been spent, Nothing remains but wounded citizens, demolished homes, decayed corpses, and broken ideas. From what source, then, do the lenders expect to obtain the money they loan for destructive purposes? It appears to me that no financial institution should lend a million dollars in banknotes to a maniac who plans to use these banknotes as fuel in a fireplace. The best return the lender can expect is to gather up the ashes that remain. But to return more pertinently to our question of why there is unemployment. Since 1929, unemployment has been with us constantly. 
It is true that following 1932, more practical sympathy has been given to the pitiful cries of the dispossessed. It is true that some $40 billion had been expended for the relief of the needy. But it is likewise true that these dollars were borrowed from the same source that paid for the conduct of the war. And in borrowing them, a millstone of national and international debt has been placed about the necks of industry, of labor, and of agriculture, which forces them to expend a great part of their ordinary profits or earnings in supporting not only the bonds which resulted from the world war, but also the interest-bearing bonds which have come into existence for the purposes of a relief which fail to relieve. Bonds and coupons are constantly falling due. Interest on debts is forever eating away at the foundations of our national security. Unless there is another world war, and God forbid that you or I should share responsibility for its declaration unless there is another world war. I can see no solution for the problem of unemployment as long as we continue protecting and using a financial system of debts and dollars which after six years of heroic trial has proven incompetent to reduce unemployment very substantially. Oh, yes, this is the system which gives billions of dollars for destruction. But on the declaration of peace, not a million dollars for production. Ladies and gentlemen, I am simply presenting to you a condition, not a theory. It is a condition which every person understands. Besides the jobless and the dolesters, there are millions of men around us who are forced to labor at temporary work. Only a small percentage of our businessmen and farmers are operating at a profit. All this is alarming when we realize that to the problem of unemployment, there has been added the other problem of confiscatory taxation. Taxation which siphons more than one out of every three dollars you laborers earn from your pay and rope. Taxation, which resting so heavily upon industry and commerce, forces you industrialists and commercial men to pay money for the conduct of government when that money should be paid by you under ordinary circumstances to the laborers who are working for you. Not only is labor almost at the end of its patience and deserving of our practical sympathy, so too, ladies and gentlemen, is industry. So too is commerce. These two are deserving of our sympathy. They are deserving of our united assistance. There is only one ray of hope which filters through the clouds of despair. It is the changing attitude of labor towards industry and industry towards labor. Two and four years ago, there were many labor leaders preaching the gospel of class warfare. They were blaming industry for all their ills. But that attitude is changing. And I believe that labor and industry are coming to a better mutual understanding. The intelligent labor leaders are beginning to understand that every industrialist is anxious to operate his factory for a full 12 month period. That it is only with reluctance that an industrialist suspends activity. During the idle months, such items as land taxes, insurance, interest on investment, these must be paid by the industrialist. There is no profit for him in idle machinery or in idle men, and if idleness persists, the industrialist will soon lose his factory to the government through confiscatory taxation. On the other hand, the industrialist is learning that the ordinary laborer is more interested in uninterrupted work. The ordinary laborer cannot subsist, so the industrialist understands, on less than a thousand dollars a year. The ordinary laborer must receive much more than a thousand dollars a year 
if he is able to purchase his groceries, his rent, his fuel, and at the same time buy the products of industry. If industry continues paying labor such a meager salary that he can only subsist upon it, who then will buy the motor cars, the refrigerators, the radios, the products of our factories? If there's no purchasing power, if there is no market, industry is forced to close. Ladies and gentlemen, I am of the opinion, and it is only my opinion, that if we must seek the cause of unemployment, we must go back further than the industrialists. Because the problem of unemployment is just as much a problem for the industrialist as it is for the laborer. If it is not solved, it means the dissolution of both. It means the loss of every invested dollar in land, building, equipment, and all things else, which represent the physical cost of a factory to an industrialist. It means the sapping of the industrialist savings through the process of insurance and taxation. And it means for both the laborer and the industrialist that as long as there is no adequate purchasing power in this nation, predicated not against the debts we owe, but against the goods we need to buy and consume, both the industrialist and the laborer are flirting with disaster, and so is the United States of America. This day then calls for a union of industry and labor to fight against a common enemy, the common enemy of an unjust, insane financial system that forces both industry and labor to surrender the major part of their earnings for the redemption of bonds, bonds that were employed for destruction and war. For your reflection, let me ask you who imposed upon us this present system of credit money which succeeds in producing prosperity only when we are preparing for war, only when we are engaged in war, and only when the controllers of this money system are preparing for the confiscation of America's homes and farms and factories who imposed it upon us. This system which we are following was developed for us by the Rothschilds and inflicted upon us by the international bankers. The time has arrived when internationalism must give way to reasonable nationalism and when a national financial system planned for the common welfare of the industrialist, the laborer, the farmer, and the professional man must be substituted for the international credit dollar which exists for the welfare of those who grow fat upon war and whose country is where their fortune lies. My friends, again I remind you that I do not wish to be dogmatic. These are only my opinions. But I ask you to give considerable thought to the basic question, why is there unemployment? The answer will be found not so much in the failure of the law of supply and demand to operate as in the obstruction which prevents it from operating. The answer will be found not so much in any presupposed antagonism existing between industry and labor as in the heresy which has substituted internationalism for sound nationalism. The answer will be found not so much in our inability to produce all and more than we need as in the impediment which prevents production and therefore which prevents the purchasing and the consumption of goods. The answer will be found not so much in seeking ways and means to alter our constitution to fit the program of communism or Nazism, as it will in seeking a way to let our constitution operate free from the entanglements with which the servants of the internationalists have constricted it. The answer will be found not so much in making our sole objective the material welfare of America, as it will in recapturing the vanishing virtue of Christian charity, which bids us regard our fellow men as a brother in Christ, 
and which warns us that whatsoever we do unto him, we do unto Christ himself. In these answers, the internationalist expresses no concern. The only law of supply and demand which he recognizes is the monopolization of production and the confiscation of goods. The only constitution which he respects is material progress and world domination. The only God whom he worships is the calf of gold. And at all times, the charity which he expounds is the exploitation of the poor with its ultimate war and destruction through which he profits. My friend, when will we learn the simple truth which condense are expressed in these words? When there is war, there is no unemployment because the warmongers who dominate government and control money issue plenty of credit for destruction. When there is peace, there is unemployment because the peoples of the world are busy paying taxes and redeeming bonds. Therefore, both patriotism and Christianity are concerned vitally in helping us to solve the problem of unemployment and at the same time in maintaining peace. I believe that we can have prosperity and peace at the same time. I do not subscribe to the proposition that if we have prosperity, we must have war. That's Satan's gospel. Peace is the gospel of Christ. Both patriotism and Christianity, therefore, are concerned with these problems because upon their successful solution in America depends the preservation of our country and the safeguarding of our religious liberty. The radio and the press today are filled with the propaganda of war. Once more the enemies of Christ are about to restore prosperity to the cauldron of destruction. Shall we Americans, therefore, permit ourselves to engender an artificial hatred towards any nation through propaganda to satisfy the merchandisers of murder and the owners of debt? Or shall we, in the spirit of George Washington and his no foreign entanglement, demand that these war plans cease and that our government, which has proven its ability to circulate plenty of money for destruction, will begin to circulate what is needed for production. Shall our government do this? Or shall our government utilize a man-made misery of unemployment to deceive millions who will be regimented into the battalions of death? Therefore, my friends, may we in unison lend every honest effort for the reconstruction of the social order, an order that is staggering to destruction unless this problem of unemployment plus peace is solved. The genius of America, which succeeded in building cities where pine trees grew, in cultivating golden fields of wheat where buffaloes roam, that same genius can and must in this emergency banish from our minds all fears arising from 10 million unemployed, 10 million who soon, please God, will find profitable employment for themselves and their families. Good afternoon, my friends, and once more may I invite you to write to me this week for a copy of Social Justice Magazine, the magazine that has been ostracized from the newsstand because it is pro-American, pro-Christian, and pro-peace. Many thousands of persons will be writing to Father Coughlin this week 
asking him to send Social Justice Magazine directly to their home. No subscription blank is necessary. Your letter will serve as your order. This magazine is for rich and for poor. Its purpose is to preserve Americanism and Christianity by interpreting the principles of social justice. Please address your letters to Father Coughlin at Royal Oak, Michigan. As speedily as possible, your name will be enrolled on the mailing list. This mailing list under no circumstances will be ever used by any other person save by Father Coughlin and for the single purpose of mailing your magazine to you. Copies of this afternoon's address can be had by adding a note in your letter asking Father Coughlin to mail you a printed copy this week. Until next Sunday afternoon, this is your announcer, Franklin Mitchell, on behalf of Father Coughlin, bidding you good afternoon. Ladies and gentlemen, we've presented the regular Sunday afternoon address of Father Charles E. Coughlin from Royal Oak, Michigan. The thoughts and opinions contained in this address were entirely those of the speaker and in no way reflect the policies of this station. Attention, everyone. WHBI is the only station in the metropolitan area broadcasting the weekly talks of Reverend Charles E. Coughlin. All sorts of pressure have been used by critics of Father Coughlin to force this station to take him off the air. They've threatened to boycott WHBI and have already started a campaign to intimidate those who use this station as an advertising medium. WHBI believes in free speech as guaranteed in the Constitution of the United States. It's also our desire to be fair to everyone. Our facilities have always been available to everyone without regard for race, color, creed, or political affiliation. Those who take issue with Father Coughlin can obtain time on this station to answer him, just as the Jewish Welfare Council did several weeks ago on Sunday, December 11, 1938. That is in accord with our American custom of free debate. WHBI will not retreat. As far as this station is concerned, Father Coughlin's broadcast will continue. If you approve of our policy, won't you let us know? And also encourage the sponsors who remained loyal to WHBI and were willing to make the sacrifice in order to preserve free speech. Your dial is set at 1,250 kilocycles. WHBI, White Brothers Incorporated, Newark, New Jersey. Is there a lady in our listening audience?